So I've been getting lots of requests from students as well as viewers asking to make a video on how to read a MRI. During our training, starting in medical school as well as even in residency and now in fellowship, we read a lot of different MRIs. And even though I'm not a radiology resident, in this video today, I'm going to be talking about how to read a MRI on a basic level so that you guys can understand it. What's up everyone, this is Dr. Webb here. Thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. You don't wanna miss them. For those who are new to the channel, welcome. My name is Dr. Antonio Webb, an orthopedic spine surgery fellow. And in basic, basic, basic terms, I'm going to be talking about how to read a MRI, specifically an MRI of the lumbar spine. We're going to be talking about that MRI. I'll try to point out some things to you. And also I will try to point out a pathology or something that a patient will present to us with and try to explain the clinical significance of that particular pathology. We're gonna flip over to my laptop and head over to the MRI now. So an MRI is just a imaging modality that we use to evaluate structures within the body. If we need it to evaluate bones or different bony anatomy, we use a X-ray or a CT scan. MRI uses a strong magnetic field with a series of radio frequency waves to render different contents within the body. There's different sequences that we can look at on an MRI scan. There's a T1 weighted sequence and there's a T2 weighted sequence. The different images will appear brighter or darker depending on which sequence you use and which structures that you're looking at. So for a T1 weighted sequence, the fat is usually bright or we call it hyper intense. The water is usually dark or hypo-intense. Usually in spine surgery, we look at the T2 weighted sequences. and this, the fat will be bright as well as the water will be bright. So any type of pathologies or inflammation, edema, infection, we look at the T2 weighted sequences and they should appear hyper-intense or bright. Usually T1 sequences are used to evaluate the signal intensity of the bone marrow. It's hyper intense because there's a lot of fat within the bone marrow. So the fat on T1, it's bright. So on a T1 weighted image, if you see dark bone marrow, that's some type of pathologic process that is going on within the bone marrow. So if we look at the different images here, this is a sagittal view or from the side here and this is the axial view looking at it from top down this is the front this is the back here this is where the belly is the belly's up here because the patients land on their back and usually we look at the lumbar vertebrae we start from the bottom this is the l5 vertebrae l4 l3 l2 and l1 you have five lumbar vertebrae there are some patients who have different anomalies which they have six but majority of people have five lumbar vertebrae. And this kind of line here corresponds to this axial cut. So these are cut images of different, basically slices of the uh, spine itself. This is the intervertebral disc here. You can see it's bright, hyper intense. That's a normal appearing disc because within the uh, disc here, this corresponds to this right here, there's a lot of fluid and a lot of water within the disc to is basically the cushion between the bones. On the outer portion of the disc is called the angulus fibrosis. This is the more hardened or thickened area that prevents and keeps the cushion or the jelly, the nucleus pulposus, within this area. And if this soft or jelly cushion area here comes out, it can press on this structure, which is the spinal cord and the nerve roots. So the spinal cord usually ends around L1 or L2, and then down here is what you call, we call the cauda equina. Also, another name for it is like a horse's tail, kind of the feathers or the strings that come in off of the horse's tail. And that's similar to the spinal cord where the cauda equina is here. This is the back here, this is the front, this is the spinous process, this is the lamina on both sides. And these are the facet joints. You have a superior articular facet and also a inferior articular facet. And these are basically just 
two bones that support the structures in the back. So this is a normal appearing disc at L1, L2. This is the L1 vertebrae, L2 vertebrae, and we refer to the disc level as between those two bones. So this is the cushion here. If we go down to the next level, you can see there's a lot less normal appearing disc at this level here. The spinal cord is here. These are, these are where the nerves kind of come off to the side here and exit and go to their corresponding portions of the body where they innervate. And we keep going down. This is the L3, L4, and L5. So this is the L3, L4 vertebrae. This is the L3, L4 disc level. And if you go back to this level here and then a little bit higher, you can see that the white area here, the hyper intense, the cushion between the two bones is fairly normal here and we call this desiccation. You see it gets darker. As we age, these discs kind of dry out and they lose some of their water content. You can see this patient here at this level has a lot less water content than this previous level up here. You can see the kidneys are starting to come in right here. This is the right kidney, this is the left kidney. And when you read in the MRI scan, the side that is here it's actually the right side, and this is the left side, just because of the way the patient is positioned. You can see the aorta here and the inferior vena cava, the two big structures in the front of the belly. And we're gonna come down to a additional level. These are your psoas muscles here, two big muscles that allow you to flex your hip. And you can see he has a little tear right here in the annulus, which is the outer portion of the disc here and a little bit less room for the nerves to exit. And this is a little highway that they exit right here, just like cars that are exiting off a highway. The dural sac or thecal sac contains all the nerve rootlets here and they come off and they exit. So they're exiting here, and they're exiting here. So if we carry it down to L4, L5 level, this is the fourth vertebrae, this is the fifth vertebrae. You can see the nerves have a little bit less room. We call that stenosis. There's less room and there's structures that are pressing on the nerve. Usually when that happens, the patient's gonna have pain, they can have discomfort, they can have weakness. And if we go down to the last level, L5S1, lumbar five, this is the sacrum here. You can see that there's a large disc herniation. So this nucleus pulposus of the jelly has protruded out. We call that a disc herniation. And this is the left side of the body. This is the right. So it's pressing on the left nerve root at the L5-S1 level. Usually when there's a disc herniation at this level here, L5-S1, it usually affects the S1 nerve root or the sacral nerve root number one. This nerve root is responsible for providing sensation to the outside of the leg, back behind the calf, the lateral side of the foot, and also the bottom of the foot. In addition, it provides motor innervation to plantar flexion of the ankle. So patients won't be able to stand on their tippy toes or they may have pain or discomfort, just like you're pressing on the gas pedal to propel the car forward. Well, a patient may have weakness in plantar flexion of their foot if there's a disc herniation at this level here. So the S1 nerve root, I would expect this patient when to have pain, discomfort, maybe some numbness and tingling on the lateral side of the foot, possibly on the plantar surface of the foot, because if you look at the dermal tomal map of the body, this is where the S1 nerve root would provide sensation. If we check their reflexes, their Achilles reflexes may be abnormal or hypo-reflexic, which means they have a decreased reflex in their Achilles. But if we go back up to the L4, L5 level, if there was a disc herniation, say, on this side here, this is, the remember, the right side of the body, it usually would affect the lower nerve root, so the L5 nerve root on the right side. So the patient would have numbness and tingling in the L5 distribution, which is the dorsum of the foot. The L5 nerve root also innervates the extensor hallucis longus, which is the big toe, elevating your big toe. So the patient may have weakness in that particular muscle, as well as the gluteus medius. So they may have trouble abducting or lifting up their hip from the mid portion of their body. So this is just a basic tutorial and how to read a lumbar MRI. 
We usually get this to evaluate the spine as well as the spinal cord and nerve roots to see if there is some type of compression, also called stenosis. And when there is a disc herniation, say for instance there's one here on the left side at L5S1, we do what's called a microdiscectomy, which means we take the patient to surgery, we lay them on their belly, we use a burr or some instruments to remove this bone here, get access to this portion of that disc herniation to remove the pressure on that nerve right there. Usually surgery takes about an hour or hour and a half and the patients usually stay in the hospital for 24 hours and then go home. If you look at the sagittal view here, this is just looking at it from the side. So we're looking at the left side here. This corresponds to this right here. There's the fat that's around the nerve right there. The dark structure is the nerve, 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 nerve. And when there's a herniation at this level out here, this herniation, this disc right here can press on that nerve and that's called foraminal stenosis. And usually this is where the nerve comes out of the spine here, it travels this way and goes to the foramen. So that's foraminal stenosis. So I hope this video helps you guys in understanding the basics of an MRI, what we use it for as spine surgeons. You can get an MRI on pretty much any portion of the body, of the heart, of the lungs, of the kidneys. Normally we get an x-ray or a CT scan to look at the bony details, look at the bones. And MRIs are good to evaluate soft tissue pathologies or look at the different organs within the body. I hope you guys learned something. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. We'll see you next time.